I think I have a new theory of gravity. Now, I know a little bit about quantum mechanics because I used to be an electronics engineer. And most of modern electronics does in fact work on principles that are derived from quantum mechanics. For example, things like electron tunneling and barrier potentials, they're quantum mechanical theories um, that also happen to work in actual fact. Now, in the old days, we used to think that an atom looked like that. It was a tennis ball and there were lots of these tennis balls and that made a molecule. But now we suddenly found that there were things inside the atom. We had neutrons, we had protons, and whizzing around the outside of it, we had an orbit with a negatively charged electron. And in fact, we used to think this is exactly what atoms were like. That electrons went round in orbits, sometimes with one, sometimes with two electrons, sometimes with three, depending on which orbital shell, as we call them, that they were in. And very often in textbooks, you'd see orbital diagrams for electrons that looked a bit like this. Well, of course, with the advent of quantum physics, we suddenly found that this was not at all so. And nowadays, even kids in school are taught that this is not the way things are. Instead, what you have is you have this areas like this. And around here, you might have this funny shape like that. And you know that somewhere in here, there'll be a neutron. Somewhere in here, there'll be a proton. Somewhere in here, there'll be a proton. And somewhere in this strange three-dimensional shape here, there'll be an electron. And it's all governed by probability. And the higher probability areas are more likely to have an electron in them. So let's say, this is a very probable area where the electron is, but every now and again you might find it over here, or down here, or over here. We don't know until we actually measure it. All we've got to go on is it could be there somewhere. So we found that all these subatomic particles work on probability theory, as do photons, for example, hence the two slit experiment. So the chances are that a subatomic particle is going to be where it's most likely to be, but it could be somewhere else. So given that, let's conduct a little thought experiment. You're probably wondering how this relates to gravity, but please bear with me. Here we have a box. In this box, we have a bowling ball and the rest of the box is a vacuum. Now, we're hunting for an electron inside this box. Where's it likely to be? Well, no marks if you say there. In fact, the only place a sane person would go hunting for an electron in this box is going to be there. So the probability of an electron being found in this box is highest in this area here. And in fact, because we know that probability is a strange thing, and we know that particles can be in more than one place at the same time, we can't say for sure that there's not going to be an electron there all the way over in the corner of the box. All we can say is it's very, very unlikely. So there's a gradient of probabilities. And as you get closer and closer and closer to the bowling ball, the probabilities go up until in the bowling ball, you're virtually certain, not 100% certain, 
to find an electron at any point you look at. And the reason I say not 100% certain is that atoms are mostly empty space. But you're pretty likely to find one there, pretty unlikely to find one there. So that's an example of a probability distribution. Now let's look at this in a slightly different way. Here we've got our box again. Here we have our bowling ball, exactly as we had before. But over here we've got an atom. Now, as we said before, it's all probabilities, strange little mushy shapes, and somewhere in this cloud around the outside it could be electrons. Now we know that the chances of finding any of these particles are more if they're over here than they are if they're over here. So it's more likely that when these particles pop into existence they're going to be there, there and there than they are there, there and there. So the net result of that is that the atom drifts towards the highest probability of those particles being in existence. Now, this is gravity. The bigger the mass, the more likely it is that the particle is going to be over there. The bigger this mass, the more likely it is that the particle is going to stay exactly where it is. Exactly the same behaviour as gravity. And this explains a few other things about gravity as well. And that is that gravity cannot be shielded. Unlike electromagnetic radiation, we can't shield something from the effects of gravity. And it becomes obvious why, if gravity is in fact probability at work, then all we can do is make it less probable that the particles are going to be over there, i.e. destroy this. <laughs> and this is why gravity is so difficult. So this mechanism could also explain a number of other things. Like take for example dark matter. We know that there is a lot more matter in the universe than we can observe. Well imagine this. Here we have an area in which there are a lot of other masses scattered all over the place like this. And this atom in the middle here all of the components of this atom, including the electrons around the outside and the protons and the neutron, must experience an outward force due to being attracted to this other matter. Because it's prob probable, it distorts the probability. So this electron shell is going to be quite large in a place like say the Earth or even in the Earth's general vicinity. Because there are other things, there's other atomic forces that hold this electron in place, but it's stretched. It's stretched by probability. Now if you go into deep interstellar space where there is nothing there's one or two hydrogen atoms perhaps per cubic meter. This atom could wind up being one heck of a lot smaller. Maybe half the size or a third of the size. Physical size that is. And this could explain dark matter. And why is that? Well, we have an idea how much the universe should weigh, how much mass there should be in it. But when we look through our telescopes, we can't see that mass. A lot of that mass, we know, is in dust clouds. 
Well, if a dust cloud is in interstellar space and the atoms that make up that dust cloud or gas cloud are smaller than they would be inside our solar system, then our measurements which look at the density of that cloud by looking at the light that's shining from the stars behind it being filtered out and coming to us and we say that cloud has got such and such a density but if those atoms are smaller we'd be wrong there would be much more mass inside that dust cloud than we think there is and this could be the explanation for dark matter now people are going to say oh well but Einstein had a theory of gravity and he did and here it is he said that if you imagine space as a rubber sheet space time as a rubber sheet then when you put a mass in the middle it deforms the sheet downwards and you've got the mass at the bottom and things take longer to go down that curve um, and so on and so forth and that gravity was just an effect of distorting space and time well that's fine as a theory no one's ever proved it and in fact I would argue that there is a substantial disproof of Einstein's theory that space and time distorts with gravity and that disproof is the pioneer spacecraft because if space distorted by a, or any sort of reasonably detectable amount the electronics on that spacecraft which are reliant on very fine tolerances would simply stop working if time distorted at all then the frequency of radio signals transmitted by that spacecraft would also change depending on what gravity is in the local place where the spacecraft is so if the spacecraft is is near a planet and there it is near a planet we would expect that the frequency of the signal would be as it is on earth if it was in between two planets where essentially there is zero gravity then we would expect a frequency shift we would expect it to be a different frequency but that is not what happens so that tells us that Einstein's theory of space and time distorting is wrong and it has to be something else and my something else is quite simply probability if an atom is in a probability gradient it will tend to move towards the area of highest probability of its particles existing there and of course as each little bit moves it drags the molecule with it the molecule drags the object with it and so unlike scientists who turn around and say oh well quantum events can't have an effect on larger scales I would disagree because trillions of quantum events I would say would have an effect on a larger scale so I hope you found this an interesting idea share it with any physicists you know um, especially those with a knowledge of quantum mechanics they will appreciate it and please like subscribe and share thank you very much